Uh, we're going to go ahead and start the uh, movie, and it, it takes a while to uh, show it. So uh, you'll be able to finish eating while you watch the movie. and commander of Apollo 17. He would be the last Apollo astronaut to stand on the surface of the I may add a comment now and then. Dr. Harrison Schmidt, better known as Jack. He would be the first geologist to set foot on an alien world. We're going to try to get some lights off the screen. Ronald Evans, command module pilot. He would remain in lunar orbit, operating a battery of experiments that would take this last close look at the moon. In the year 1675, Sir Isaac Newton was asked by his fellow scientist, Robert Hooke, how he had accomplished so much. If I have seen further, Newton wrote, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. That white room was run by Gunter Vint. Some of you knew Gunter. Remarkable guy. One point five million pounds of thrust in each of those uh, F1 engines. Cutoff was automatic, done by the sequencer. One command. Pressurized yes Rocco Patron. Despite the fact that it was going to be done manually, the sequencer in effect said, uh, I didn't tell you to do it, and therefore you can't be doing it. For a certain second, it very properly stopped the operation. Uh, most of the work was being done right off the firing room in the launch control center at Kennedy. However, there was a great deal of support from the Marshall Space Flight Center. We had a 30, we had a two hour and 40 minute delay. It started at 30 seconds before the first attempt to launch. That was because the uh, launch computer thought uh, that it, uh, the rocket had ignored its signal on uh, pressurization. In fact, a human being had pressurized the tank that the computer had not, but the computer didn't know it. about 14 seconds for the uh, Saturn to clear the tower. After checking out the spacecraft in Earth orbit, they burned out of orbit and headed toward the moon. Those uh, bright objects around the S-4B turned out to be uh, chunks of ice that had uh, remained on the uh, S-4B, the third stage, after accumulating in the uh, humid fo Florida atmosphere. Even as Cernan, Evans, and Schmidt headed toward the moon, directly below the Apollo 17 control room, flight director Don Putty ran his crew through a launch simulation for the first Skylab. Uh, as you're probably well aware, we are still working on other programs, Skylab being the prime effort starting in the spring of, this, of uh, next year. Uh, we're also working on the uh, cooperative mission with the Russians which will take place in 1975. And of course, we've got quite a few of uh, the flight control team as well as other center elements involved in the work on the shuttle. So it, it's the start of a new era, I hope. Skylab, of course, will fly in the spring of next year with three men going up and spending 28 days. And then two months later after they land, we'll 
put three men up for 56 days. They'll come down, and 30 days later, another three will go for 56 days. So a year of uh, 73, calendar year, will certainly be a busy one from the standpoint of manned space flight. December 10, 1972. America and Challenger went into orbit around the moon. Houston, is it America? You can breathe. The next day, December 11th, Simon and Smith enter the lunar module and undock. Houston, 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 Houston. You look just as pretty in Earth light as you do in uh, sunlight. On our first orbit around the moon, I actually saw a flash of a meteor impact. Uh, in the uh, light of Earth light. Roger, uh, America. Have a good bird. Valley Tars of Tars Litro is deeper than the Grand Canyon. That's where we're headed. You'll see it in a moment. With the command module in the distance, they passed over their land. Ron Evans is getting ready to take some landmark sightings that improved our state vector. Here they hope to find the youngest material yet sampled. That's the valley there, as you can see. That highest mountain's 2,100 meters high. Pitch over at 8,000 feet above the surface. I'm giving him uh, coordinates for an uh, optical device that told him exactly where the computer would land us if we did nothing else. There's the shadow of the Challenger in the uh, zero phase point. Extremely well. We thank you very much. As Cernan drove the equipment laden rover, Schmidt carried the scientific experiments package called ALSEP. Hey, you need me, Gene? Well, I'm going to go deploy an ALSEP. Have at it. In Houston, scientists in the science support room watch, correlating and directing their movements. They didn't get to do much directing, I'm sorry. As you set up the various experiments, Cernan drilled a series of holes, both to collect core samples and to implant experimental probes. Okay. Oh, we're up, we're up. 
the blanket of Camelot for sure now. Yeah. Man, yeah, it didn't feel like this stuff was that hard. Cernan had asked me to come over and help him with the extraction of the uh, core. Oh, he's going slowly, though. Very slowly. I'm going to get this thing out now that I got it. Needless to say, he didn't ask me to come back. By the way, Gene was just starting to deploy a neutron probe that, that uh, the data from which has given us some idea of the uh, neutron flux in the surface of the moon. So many hours of life in the vacuum of the moon. We're up in all the area. Cable. 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 With the LSEP functioning, they left the site for a shortened sampling traverse. Well, many parts of the LSEP are functioning very well. The uh, heat source experiment is working excellently. It's transmitting back temperature data. The uh, cooling down, it's still cooling down from the, uh, the drilling process. Dave Strangler is Canadian. They should be starting to get true heat flow information. Let's see if I can't crack the uh, corner and get that contact. If I can't get her. It was time to head back to the Challenger, activate experiments, and get back inside. Man. I was rolling on the moon, one day, in America. As the astronauts rested, engineers in two nations were working out technical problems of the Apollo Soyuz test program, the first joint Russian and American space mission. Uh, well, the prime purpose of the Apollo Soyuz joint mission is to prove out a uh, compatible docking system and demonstrate that we have compatible operational procedures that will let two different countries dock in space. I think more than that, it has a certainly a symbolic meaning of the two large powers uh, learning to work together in space, which I believe are the new seas of mankind, the new frontiers, to work out solutions to problems wherein, uh, although we're very competitive, uh, we can still be cooperative and assist each other. And I think that this Apollo Soyuz program stands for just that. Uh, oh, what a nice day. They would have one test before they got to work exploring. The previous day, they had broken a rear fender of the rover. I'm not going to take any blame for that. Apollo 16 commander John Young had worked that night in a pressure suit on a way to fix the fender. On the moon, the astronauts put it together. The fender section formed from a lunar map molded with tape then held in place with clamps from the Lunar Module Telescope. It was a repair that would last the remainder of the mission. That was a team in the Mission Many Control Center that figured that out overnight. ...explosive packages, which would be detonated after they left the moon, mapping the lunar subsurface, much as earthly geologists explore for oil. Cernan would pick him up in the rover for the drive to the first site on this traverse. Station two. There's somewhere along this rim where they can see. But they're, but they're dropping, Bill, so they must be coming. Turns out we probably sampled pieces of the deep lunar mantle at Station Two. For Station Two, and it looks like a great place. Good It looks like quite a bit of variety from here. Different colors, anyway. Pretty hard, isn't it? That boat is gonna roll. Man, that is hard. Just don't stub your toe. 
The foreground features are somewhat different. That could be because they were farther up under the hill, I think. But that's otherwise that's remarkable. Pottery, it's obviously very uh, very cohesive because it, it, the, the bottom of the core is not smooth and very jaggedy and fragmental like. Gene is finished with the uh, uh, core tube, then we should be able to go. If we get that tail that. <laughs> I'm glad they were enjoying it. None would cause more excitement than the find of the crater called Shorty. Picture doesn't do it justice. It really was orange. That, that is really orange. I think it's the most exciting we've uh, come across uh, since the uh, beginning of the uh, Apollo program. And I believe that it's going to be the most rewarding of all the finds on Apollo. Uh, light gray material on either side. Oh man, that's incredible. Hey, Gene, we're gonna have to. That's incredible. You need to get a down sun color. There isn't enough time, Tony, to do it, no matter which way you want to do it. We need more time. <laughs> we have to put five in a little bit. He's getting about, uh, about three centimeters away. they got to leave at a certain time, regardless of what we got. We need to give up all the light metal stuff. They have to leave Shorty Crater and its orange soil and push on. Time, the enemy of the lunar investigator on the moon and on Earth. These are boulders around the rim of that crater Camelot. The precious minutes had run out. Return to the rover, drive back to the Challenger, close out EDA-2. We'd like you to leave immediately. Okay. Oh, golly, this time goes fast. As the last Apollo crew worked on the moon, the engineers on Earth prepared for tomorrow's day in space. Uh, I have a model here of the space shuttle. As you see, it uh, resembles a double wing airplane on top of a uh, propulsion system. The system is going to be designed so all of the costly parts are reusable. Uh, now that we're beginning to understand space, we begin to understand uh, the potential, the economic potential. The need is to bring larger arrays of instrumentation up in space. The need to provide man with a real capability to work up in space. Okay, Bob, I'm on a pad. And about 4.30, a Wednesday afternoon, as I step out onto the plains of Taurus Littrell. Beautiful valley. December 13th. Yesterday, they had explored the south end of the valley. Today, they would go north. Well, let's ask for you. This is the last time for you to really go to that part. We know you'll do it, boys. Yeah. Uh, Molly, Molly. <laughs> Why are we on a slope? You okay? We're working on about a 20 degree slope here. Apollo science will continue. And I'm sure you might see the mystery uh, will continue to come out for many years to come. But of this I'm sure, man has learned that space is his to explore. And man will return to space to explore to the moon and beyond. Rock 
I'm firmly convinced that it's changed the whole basis of philosophy, including religion. But I don't think that we've begun to see uh, what the era of space flight really is. It, uh, we've got a long way to go, and I hope I'm living when we leave this solar system on a venture to find another planet Earth. Challenger. But before they left the surface of the moon, there would be a brief ceremony. It's a rock composed of many fragments of many sizes and many shapes. When we return this rock, or some of the others like it to Houston, we'd like to share a piece of this rock with so many of the countries throughout the world. We hope that this will be a symbol of what our feelings are, what the feelings of the Apollo program are, and a symbol of mankind that we can live in peace and harmony in the future. And a final word from the last man on the moon. I'd like to just let what I believe history will record that America's challenge of today has forged man's destiny of tomorrow. While Cernan and Schmidt closed out the last moonwalk and prepared for tomorrow's liftoff, Ron Evans worked on in orbit. Photograph, observe, describe. Keep operating the cameras and experiments in the science experiments bay. In orbit, as on the surface, the seconds are precious. Possibility of the third. Uh, how is the experiment working now? Mr. Working extremely well. We're looking for subsurface geologic structure in the broad sense. Layering, uh, for example. This is the infrared scanning radiometer. Uh, what, uh, what does that do? The radiometer measures the temperature of the moon and makes a, an accurate map of the temperature uh, beneath the spacecraft. And it is working with uh, tremendous success. Uh, one other thing, how is the experiment uh, working mechanically as far as the man and the machine? The experiment itself, the hardware is working perfectly. Precisely the way it's supposed to work, everything functions properly. An important part of the experiment is that it requires the man to operate it. That was the crater Copernicus. 99, proceeded. 3, 2, 1, ignition. stage of Challenger, forever on the moon, they left a plaque reading, Here Man Completed His First Explorations of the Moon, December 1972 A.D. May the spirit of peace in which we came be reflected in the lives of all mankind. One revolution later, Cernan and Schmidt caught up with Evans and prepared for docking. Good to see you. Good to have you all back up here. It's been a good trip. Man, that John is a beautiful vehicle. You bet you. December 16th. Burn out of lunar orbit and head home to Earth. Man. This is it. December 17th, 170,000 miles from Earth, 
Ron Evans left the command module. Hello, Mark. We see you, Ron. Looking great. Okay. Hey, John. How you doing? Hi, Jimmy. Evans was retrieving film canisters from the two cameras and the lunar sounding radar. Data vital to the scientists on Earth. And the left one's there. Before he got back inside, Evans took a last look at the Crescent Earth. In two more days, they would be home. December 19th. They rode inside a 5,000 degree fireball through the atmosphere of Earth. Still in the spacecraft, almost 250 pounds of the moon. This is a golden chapter in the age of space exploration. In a way, it brings a close to what has been a very romantic era in space exploration. But, and I want to make this very strong, the book is still being written. Have some questions. Yes. What was the yellow or the orange soil? Turns out to be uh, orange volcanic ash, and it uh, was lying. It was a top layer on a series of layers that were exposed in the core that we took. Uh, it's about a 70 centimeter core. Uh, the uh, below that, the orange though, it was black. Yeah, black because the uh, uh, glass has begun to devitrify. And the, and the color changed, the color of the glass changed because of that. The color was the result of, the, of a specific iron-titanium ratio. And on Apollo 15, it turned out, once we found this, we realized we had in the Apollo 15 collection some green glass, which had a different iron-titanium ratio. Uh, and that's why it was green. So now, uh, increasingly with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, high-resolution photography <clears throat> and other information, we're noticing that there's a lot more of these so-called pyroclastic volcanic deposits around the moon. Uh, we knew there were a lot, but not as much as we're now seeing. And it could well be that, uh, well, let me, before I say that, uh, about five years ago, a team uh, hit, led by uh, Saul at Brown found indigenous water inside the olivines that are in that orange glass. And it may well be that the, the water that we're now uh, seeing, the water ice we're seeing at the poles, is ancient volcanic water. 
Uh, that's still yet to be determined, but it's one potential uh, source of that water. Yes? As a geologist, uh, what were you able to do that made a big difference compared to someone who is a non-geologist? I think the main, the main thing is that I helped put together the training program for the non-geologists. Uh, and uh, uh, that, uh, I think, uh, it meant that each of the missions became much more productive as they got more and more field experience. Uh, in, the, uh, in, in that training. Each uh, of the last three missions uh, trained, well, actually it began with Apollo 13. Uh, Jim Lovell and his crew were the guinea pigs. I uh, went to Al Shepard and said, let's take charge of that training program like we do everything else. And he said, well, if you can convince Jim Lovell to do it, well, go ahead. And so Jim agreed and uh, he began to persuade other people to take part and take up that training program. So it made a big, big difference. Specifically for the Apollo 17 mission, what I bring was the same thing that the test pilots brought, that everybody brought, was a, a, a broader spectrum of experience in a, in a particular arena. And that's what you want to do uh, when you, and we're doing it increasingly now, of course, with uh, the space shuttle, with the uh, uh, International Space Station, we're taking people who have specific areas of expertise, and they can apply that expertise in, in areas of, uh, of interest to the uh, scientific and the operational community. Yes. Thank you. Jack, I come from a company called Blue Abyss, and we're working with a chap called Professor Walter Kuhnegger. And Walter was the PI that developed the way you moved on the moon all those years ago and he's a wonderful old chap. It looked relatively easy as you were hopping and doing the kangaroo jump. Did you feel it easy on the day or was that actually quite strenuous? Uh, in spite of the restrictions of the A7LB shoot, uh, which was a significant improvement over the uh, uh, A7L suit that was used on the uh, first three missions, uh, it, uh, was, uh, it was really easy to, to maneuver uh, on the moon. Uh, you didn't worry about falling very much. It was uh, obviously, <laughs> it was uh, a, uh, you know, one-sixth environment. It's like being a kid again at uh, one-sixth your height. And uh, so you're not going to hit very hard. And the suit was like a suit of armor. It was really tough. The, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, it would have lasted uh, a large number of of cycles, but nevertheless, uh, for us, it was uh, perfectly adequate. The only diff major difficulty that, that I had, and I think everybody had, was with the gloves. Uh, you're, it's like putting your hand in a balloon, at, and uh, for us, 3.7, approximately 3.7 to 4 PSI, depending on the part of the mission. And every time you squeeze it, you're squeezing a tennis ball. And that works these forearm muscles uh, so that they get fatigued. If you're not careful, they get fatigued uh, very quickly. And uh, you saw where I was carrying the barbell of the uh, ALCEP, the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiment Package out. Uh, I, I went about 180 yard uh, meters before I uh, uh, found a place that I thought was uh, compatible with what we had to do with that experiment. Looking at the uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter high-resolution pictures of the landing site, I should have stopped about 80 yards sooner. <laughs> but that, uh, that barbell carry really started to fatigue my forearms. And I had to, throughout every EVA, I had to m try to manage that fatigue. Now, knowing what I know now and knowing what has uh, the training that's gone into the, particularly the uh, ISS construction, we should have had very specific trainers to work very specific muscles as the uh, construction crews have had on the ISS. Uh, they've done them, they've had much less of a problem with that, uh, as I understand talking with them, than, than, than we had in Apollo. Uh, we just didn't understand the kind of physiological training that we should have had and, and the targeted training uh, we should have had for that, uh, those kind of operations. Yes. Oh, excuse me, let me say one other thing about that. What I found, and I strongly recommend this to the young people in the audience, and we hopefully will have many more uh, in the future, is that they, if, if you're going to be on the moon and you want to move any distance at all, use a cross-country skiing technique. In the last few pictures where I was coming towards the camera, 
you notice that I was striding? Well, that was basically a cross-country skiing technique where I was gliding above the surface rather than on the surface. It's very efficient, very low energy expenditure, and all you have to do is use a toe push uh, in order to take the next stride, and you can, you can accelerate. To, you're moving quite, quite rapidly across the surface. So, and that also will extend your uh, walk-back distance uh, from whatever vehicle or uh, habitat you might have. You, if you have an efficient way to move rapidly across the surface, you can extend that walk-back distance. Yes, sir. Great, thank you. Uh, there are some reports that because of the lack of atmosphere, the visual perceptual, you know, just the way things look was different. Can you talk to that and share that? Did it ever affect the reach or the perception of distance that you had? It never affected the short term, the, the immediate uh, thing, for, as, our, as near as I could tell. But we already knew from previous missions, in fact, Neil Armstrong made the point uh, right from the first, that everything looked like it was closer than it really was. It's like driving, driving across Nevada. <laughs> you, know, you think that next ridge is a lot closer uh, than it really is. And it's because of clear air, no air, <laughs> clear no air. And, uh, and so knowing that, I actually had the team in mission control ready to tell me how long my shadow was at any given time. And, uh, and I would make, before I asked them, I would make an estimate of how long that shadow looked to me. And then I'd ask them, how long's my shadow? Well, invariably, it was about 50% longer. I mean, 50% shorter than what it really was. And uh, it appeared shorter. And so I just applied that factor to all my distance estimations within the near field. And it worked out pretty well, the crater diameters and things like that. So you can work around some of those kind of things, but clearly that without the atmosphere and without, maybe more importantly, without familiar objects, uh, you're going to uh, underestimate distances. Any other questions? Yes. Earlier about the uh, lunar dust, and um, you said that you had inhaled four times, was it? I had four inhalations. I'm very did proud you, of it. Did you feel it? Were there any effects at all that you could tell? <laughs> uh, there were. Uh, uh, first of all, it, uh, all the crews that uh, smell lunar dust uh, refer to it as smelling like gunpowder, spent gunpowder. And that's, that's a good analogy because it's activated carbon, and the individual small particles of the moon are still activated even after coming into the cabin. It takes a while for them to absorb uh, oxygen on those surfaces. Uh, and they have a very, very high surface area uh, uh, relative to mass. Uh, the, uh, the other thing is that uh, I uh, had a, uh, an initial and a gradually reducing uh, I guess you'd call it an allergic reaction in that my turbinates were swelling uh, in, in re response to that. And you can hear it in my voice if you listen to uh, that transcript. Uh, and uh, that uh, reaction was, was fairly uh, intense, not uncomfortable, but I could tell it you know, I was having that, uh, and then disappeared gradually with, with the uh, three or four days that I was exposed. Uh, the uh, uh, Bill uh, Carpentier, do you want to relate your experience? I think he and I are the only ones that have ever talked about this. Well, I didn't get exposed four times, but I got exposed three times because of, of my job, because I was on Apollo 11 and I had to open up the suit bag to get swabs. Uh, for the microbiology program, and as soon as I opened the suit bags, I got all this lunar dust all over me, and I got in my nose, in my eyes, and in my throat, and I could sort of tell it was there, but gunpowder. I thought it was kind of wet ashes, gunpowder. <laughs> but, uh, oh so God. then I was also in the quarantine with the Apollo 14 crew, and when I went into the, the spacecraft, opened up the suit bags, got lunar dust all over me, it's really, a, a, bothered my eyes and my nose, and I was having a little problems. And I looked back, because I was always a control subject, I looked back at my, my blood tests after Apollo 11, and I had an eosinophilia that I had never 
noted before. So in Apollo 14, I got another blood sample. I had a 9% eosinophilia and a 4% basophilia. So when I was going out on Apollo 15, and the microbiology people said, we don't have anybody to send to get the microbiology samples. You know, you know the drill. Will you get them? So I got into the Apollo 15 capsule, opened <laughs> up the suit bag, got covered with lunar dust, and I started to... I couldn't hardly breathe, and I started, to, I was going to sneeze, and I couldn't sneeze on the, the microbiology sample, so I had to get out of the spacecraft, take in 14 deep breaths, go back in, and don't breathe, just to get the, the remainder of the, of, the, of the samples, and sure enough, I had another 8% eosinophilia and a 3% basophilia, so it, it's a proven, I think, a proven allergy. I, I, I think you did, and... Uh... Uh, mine disappeared. Yours wasn't disappearing, which is interesting. So uh, at, at any rate, uh, now, there's a bit of a college, cottage industry on lunar dust, as many of you are aware of. And uh, I would just uh, say uh, that I think there, there, there's, there are, there's a layered engineering defense that we can develop against exposure to lunar dust, whatever its effects might be. Uh, I don't, I've never noticed anything that I would say was an effect of having uh, those four inhalations. Uh, but uh, uh, we did not do what would be necessary to find out and will not probably do it. So in the future, I would just say it's, it's just important whatever effects there might be for other, all, all sorts of other reasons, we need to have that layered defense. We need, we need suits that reject dust uh, we need not to bring suits into a habitat because they're the primary vector. Uh, and uh, we can use magnetic filters for whatever dust actually does get in because each particle of dust has this nanophase iron in it, and that makes them magnetic. And so uh, electromagnetic uh, filters that you can clean uh, will be, I think, an important final layer of that defense. Any other questions? George, you have to keep me honest here on time. Yes. Is there any active volcanic activity on the moon? That's an excellent question. Is there any active volcanic activity on the moon? The, uh, uh, probably not at this stage. The moon is contracting because it's cooling. And uh, we have what we call wrinkle ridges and thrust faults. We actually studied one in the Valley of Tars Lictro that wasn't talked about in the film. Uh, and uh, uh, those are relatively recent features, but there's no uh, direct evidence uh, yet of uh, recent volcanic activity. Now, there have been uh, emanations due to landslides and things like that, almost certainly, uh, but uh, no volcanic activity. The, uh, now, I say that, now, but from the seismic data, there are molten materials deep within the moon. Uh, below about 1,000 uh, kilometers. Moon's radius is uh, 1,700 uh, and 34 uh, kilometers. Uh, there, there is uh, uh, molten material moving in response to tidal forces. Uh, that's been pretty well established through this seismic information that we have. And uh, that, those, though, however, are probably uh, pockets of iron sulfur liquid that move back and forth. That's uh, remnants of what of the material that eventually uh, moved to the center of the moon to form the core. The core itself is about 350 kilometers in, in radius. Uh, that's probably more nerdy information than you really wanted. Uh, you had a question, yes. Go ahead. Being one of the few people who have experienced both microgravity and also one-third gravity for um, a period of time, do you, what are your thoughts on one-third gravity as something um, that humans can tolerate for long periods of time as compared to microgravity? We know what microgravity does much more to the human body than one-third gravity. Um, my uh, experience uh, on the moon with one-sixth gravity is that and I said this morning, I think I was readapting. I think it was having an effect. Uh, 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 
I would expect it to have some effect. Certainly on fluid shift, it would, you'd expect it to reduce the amount of fluid shift, if not, uh, probably not eliminate it, but reduce the amount. And uh, it's just something we're going to have to uh, learn about uh, when we start to spend more time on the moon. We had no uh, uh, op uh, planned observations to try to define that. But by the end of three excursions, I felt very comfortable working uh, in that uh, one-six gravity environment. It, uh, it, I don't think it'll be a problem for the long term. But again, we need to get that verified scientifically, and uh, I suspect we will in this case. Yeah, I, I said I said one third, but I meant one six. I know. But do I know. You, do you I'm think, sorry. Do you think that the the moon, the one six gravity, is so mu is much more adaptable for us as humans than microgravity? Oh yes, I think it is. I, f I felt very comfortable in that uh, one sixth environment. I, I but uh, and and I don't know of any information uh, that would say that you can't uh, tolerate it indefinitely. Now, uh, Let's, let's find out for sure, but, uh, and certainly once we start put settlements on the moon, we'll find out some of those kind of things. Yes? If, when we go back to the moon, if you could pick a landing spot, where would you pick the Well, you know, I, uh, as George will remember, I tried to get us to land in Silkowski <laughs> on Apollo 17. Uh, I was, uh, Chris Kraft finally cornered me in the hall of building one and said, drop it. And so we dropped that idea. But we had, uh, we had some satellite, uh, this was the group that I mentioned earlier, the Lunar Mafia was, uh, was uh, working on, say, why can't we take Apollo 17 to the far side of the moon? And we found out you probably could. We had photographic, as much photographic data on Sokoski as we had on Taurus Littro. Uh, you could put uh, communication satellites, which existed off the shelf. There were some Tyro satellites on the shelf you could have put behind the moon in, a, in the uh, libration point there. And so you, you could pretty well have done a far side landing with, with all the uh, information we like to have from the front side. The, uh, uh, but right now, I would say the, the, the most intriguing part of the moon is probably South Pole Aiken. Uh, and now exactly where in South Pole Lincoln, that's a challenge. Uh, Paul Spudis is here, and, uh, or I was here earlier. I don't see Paul, are you still here? I don't see him. Anyway, he and his colleagues, uh, particularly Brad Jolliffe at the uh, Wash uh, U in St. Louis, uh, are, have put forward a, a very, very fine proposal for landing, getting a sample from the, from. Uh, an unmanned sample from the uh, South Pole Aiken Basin. South Pole Aiken is a unique basin in that it, uh, uh, it has not uh, equilibrated like the other big basins have uh, relative to the gravity field of the moon. Isostatic adjustment is what we call it. has not occurred there in a, in a, in a major way. It is uh, 12 and a half kilometers deep relative to the uh, uh, average uh, radius of the moon. And uh, that uh, uh, suggests uh, very strongly, and some other things suggest very strongly, that it may well have sampled uh, a significant part of the upper mantle of the moon. Uh, so it makes it, from a geological point of view and from further understanding of the early impact history of the inner solar system that I mentioned earlier today, uh, that makes it a very, very attractive. But it's going to be a tough mission to just put an unmanned satellite uh, or lander there, scoop up some soil, and know the geologic environment of where that soil came from. Much better to have people there roving around, getting the context of all of a large variety of samples like we did in Taurus Littro, and you will come away with a far better scientific understanding of what you, you actually have sampled and what your measurements on those samples will mean. I see George getting nervous. Any more questions? Two more questions, yes. So having done a few of these excursions now, what would you, how would you design future ones? I would, uh, I, would I, I think the idea of having a pressurized rover that can allow you to have uh, a much longer and, and uh, multiple day excursions is, is uh, an excellent way to, to begin. Uh, 
uh, you're going to need to have some equipment on board, probably at least in the foreseeable future to do, I'll use the word triage on the samples. So, uh, because uh, bringing all of those, all the samples you could collect back uh, would probably uh, tax almost any return vehicle. Uh, the, uh, in fact, we were a little over our weight allowance, but they didn't make us throw them away uh, with the uh, 250 pounds of samples that uh, we brought back. Uh, that, uh, uh, you put a couple of geologists on the moon and they're gonna collect more rocks than you, <laughs> you want to bring back, <laughs> believe me. So you need to do some, some analytical triage. And I think the pressurized uh, rover that uh, the Johnson Space Center has been uh, looking at over the last few years, uh, started with Constellation, is uh, excuse me, is very uh, is is a good start. It's the kind of thing that you would like to have. Now, with respect to uh, uh, Mars, I think you're going to want to have uh, those rovers as well. Uh, but there you're probably going to end up having a precursor lander, uh, automated lander that would take the rovers and do a surface rendezvous then with the, uh, space, with the uh, human spacecraft that lands after that. Uh, that's probably the biggest thing that I would do uh, is, uh, is have more roving capability. Geologists like to move around. One more? Is that it? Yes. Oh, Don. Up. I may not be able to understand this one. He's a lot smarter than I am. <laughs> no, what's the characteristic link scale on the moon for seeing a new geology and, and geared towards needing a rover vehicle to at least be able to go that distance in order to get new geology from where you just happened to land? Good question. Uh, highly variable answer uh, it's going to, for example I was wasn't I did not see the orange soil recognize that slight coloration change in the surface uh, until I was within a couple three meters of it uh, and uh, the uh, even though I already one of the hypotheses we had for that particular crater was it might have been a volcanic crater and so that the kind of things you see around volcanic craters namely, uh, oxidized material that's colorful, uh, that was in the back of my mind. Uh, the, uh, now, uh, but on the other hand, it's turning out that the, the, the north side of the valley is, may be very different in terms of its uh, characteristics than the south side of the valley, and those are separated by about seven kilometers in the, at the narrowest point. And, and so there you see you'd like to have at least that to be able to visit that, that amount. Uh, every crater, uh, depending on its size, is going to sample different kinds of materials at depth. And so there again, you have another scale factor that you would be looking at. Uh, how do I get to the rim of, the, the rim of, of a variety of craters uh, to get what we would call a, a stratigraphic understanding of what the uh, layered structure of the moon, if it is layered, uh, would be. So, uh, it's going to be highly variable, and you would probably want to maximize that that distance within other constraints that you would have. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Hope you uh, enjoyed it. <laughs>